name is Denise DeLucia. I'm the Education Specialist at Women's Rights National Historical Park in Seneca Falls, New York. I'm sitting in the historic kitchen of the Seneca Falls Historical Society. I have with me today Allison Horrocks from Lowell National Historical Park in Lowell, Massachusetts. Uh, so today we're going to talk about the domestic life uh, of women, uh, the public life of women, and the role of women uh, in the industrial world. Tell me a little bit about where you're at today, Allison. I am coming to you today from Bowl, Massachusetts, and I am sitting in one part of a historic boarding house. So we are in a structure that originally would have housed several units of women who had come to Lowell to find industrial work in factories. And so the boarding house system started in the 1820s in Lowell as a way to provide residences for these new workers in the factory world. And I am sitting here today in the kitchen portion of it. Um, and just off screen, I am joined by the view of a boarding housekeeper. She's the person who would actually do all the very hard work on this stove. For scale, this is actually not very big. This stove right here would be used to feed anywhere between 24 and 40 women who were coming from farms where their mothers usually cooked for them. So women who were accustomed to being part of that system of domestic life, domestic work, they'd come to Lowell and they'd work really hard days in factories, but probably for the first time in their lives as working class women, other people cooked for them three meals a day. Now, you're also sitting here next to a stove. I am. Um, and we're using these, <laughs> we're using these today to talk about entry points into women's lives. Right. So the kind of work that they do, what's important about them. You're going to hear me talking about mill girls. And we're actually talking about people who are mostly women. So they're not really actually very young, but they call themselves mill girls because it was a temporary job that they took. And a lot of them call themselves mill girls, even if they were 25 or 30 um, or on the verge of elderly, like me, 32 in the 1840s. <laughs> um, and they called themselves girls because many of them had plans to leave, start a household of their own by marrying a man and to enter womanhood and kind of leave that girlhood of being a factory girl. Um, so as we talk about these topics today, we're talking about food and we're talking about stoves, but really as a way to understand how people ordered their lives. And Denise, can you kind of tell us more about how you use this domestic history to do women's history in Seneca Falls? Sure. So um, one of the, the stories we're tasked with telling is the story of the Seneca Falls 1848 convention. Um, the woman, one of the women who spearheaded that convention is Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And she lived right here in Seneca Falls for about 16 years. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was a woman of privilege. She uh, had a very large yard, uh, very excellent, lots of um, lawn, lots of places for all of her children to play, but she also had um, gardens uh, and, a, and a pretty large orchard. Uh, she had uh, one woman who was her uh, housekeeper for about 30 years. Um, and then um, she would bring in other help uh, here and there uh, to um, help with uh, the cooking and help with the children. But that was really how she entered the world of domestic life. Elizabeth did and loved being a mom, but she didn't love that that was her only option. When she began to fight for women's rights, she started to talk about um, women of privilege and women of means because she felt like if she spoke about women of means with everything that they had available to them and everything that they had, their education and their money and their status in their, in their town and their society, um, they still were subject to their the, the men in their life, whether it be their husband or their father or even a brother, uh, if, if, if that was to happen. Um, so as she moved from uh, domestic life and, and motherhood into this huge public sphere 
that she came to be known for, you know, she really struggled with the idea of um, the balance of domestic uh, responsibility. So even if she was able to go out and have all these conversations and do all these speeches and attend all these um, conferences, there was still somebody, you know, it, it wasn't the burden of her husband to pick up the slack, the, uh, right? It was the burden of the help that she had uh, in her home. But that also didn't, you know, that was really difficult for her too. She, she said in a letter um, in the 1850s, the late 1850s, one of her domestic helpers was leaving to go get work um, in, a, in a mill. Uh, one of probably, possibly one of the woolen mills that uh, were, you know, kind of dotted the landscape around here, um, just as the cotton mills did. Uh, and well, Elizabeth said, you know, she didn't blame this young woman. She said, I can't blame her for being tired of revolving around the cook stove. You know, that's really, you know, her connection to the, the domestic sphere, um, really from a role of a, a privileged woman. Um, I understand that's not really the case for the, um, the young women or the mill girls in Lowell. No, no uh, these were mostly people in those early decades who were coming from nearby farms. So they're being recruited and they're moving to Lowell and they're not, they don't tend to be people who are deeply impoverished. They're people whose families can spare them to go to Lowell. But they're also usually from families where affording a sizable sort of monetary package for their wedding would be hard. So going to Lowell is one way to do that. Um, these are also people living through times of tremendous social upheaval, which I think is very familiar to us in a new way right now. Um, particularly the women of the 1840s, there are a lot more people who are immigrating to the United States. So communities are changing in that way. There's also a range of social movements happening in the 1840s, which you're going to tell us about, um, and that also come to Lowell. But part of what is compounding everything else in their lives is this thing behind me. For generations, women were learning how to do domestic tasks together. They were training together, learning together, and often it was from in front of a hearth. Or in the case of enslaved women, they were also trained by other people in their lives, but forced to do that labor. In Lowell, the time of the Industrial Revolution, when people start moving to these boarding houses, is the advent of this kind of cook stove. And so everything you might have learned about how to cook in front of a hearth or using other forms of technology, it's no good. <laughs> you have to learn how to do this entirely differently. Now, you have some great stories about what's happening in terms of this change and this upheaval in the 1840s, not the least of which, of course, is the convention that women host in Seneca right. Falls. Yeah, so in 1848, um, as I mentioned, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and um, four other women uh, from this area, um, well, most of them from this area, <laughs> initiated the 1848 Seneca Falls uh, Convention for Women's Rights. Uh, and in there, they drafted the Declaration of Sentiments, um, which had, was, you know, based on the Declaration of Independence. It had a list of grievances very similar to that of the Declaration of uh, Independence. And, um, you know, in there um, was full suffrage for women, um, the right to divorce, the right to own property, um, the, the rights to an education, the rights to uh, facilitate and participate in religious activities. Um, all of those things in 1848 um, weren't afforded to women. You know, Elizabeth had a, um, a neighbor whose husband was uh, in, in the legislature. He was away a lot working for the region, and, um, and she wanted a new stove, but her husband was away. And Elizabeth convinced her to buy the stove even without her husband. <laughs> and then when he gets home, he's like, what, what is, what's this, you know, what is this big, beautiful stove doing here? Um, and it took a little while, you know, for him to um, really understand that it was okay. And it wasn't until, you know, probably many years later um, 
she also um, uh, became pretty active in the women's rights movement uh, of the moment. And, um, and her husband said, you know, I think I like her better this way. <laughs> I think she's pretty cool this way. But it all started with the stove. You know, and but really, it was really the purchasing power and the ability of, of her to, to purchase that stove without permission from her husband. Those are things that today we don't even really consider, right, as something that is that important that, you know, a woman, you know, needed a new stove uh, and was encouraged to do so. Yeah, that's a fun little story about um, Elizabeth. <laughs> So what's happening in Lowell with some of these um, young women and how is, their, how, is, how is their independence changing in the 1840s? What effects are they feeling from any of these um, social reform movements that are happening? Yeah, so in some ways, women working in Lowell, they're responding to social reform movements, things like the push for bloomers and dress reform, they're picking that up. And in other ways, they're really leading some social reform, particularly in terms of the working class movement. Um, so this space that I'm in right now, which is a boarding house, would have been really kind of a strange thing to a lot of people who were used to rural life or life on a farm. Before Lowell had boarding houses and factories, it was a small cluster of sundry farms, right? So places where people grew a variety of things and lived in farmhouses. If you were a young woman who came to Lowell, say, early 1840s, you lived with peers, you lived with other young women in your peer group, and you lived under the supervision of a boarding housekeeper, usually a woman a bit older than you, or possibly a widow. And they had something that I think we all still understand is very precious, which is time where they're not working, so they're not beholden to the bells of the factory, and time when they don't have to do domestic labor or care work for other people. This might only be three hours a day, but if you think of your own life, how much time is really truly your own every day? It's really hard to carve that out for a variety of reasons. So women coming from these farming communities where they're expected to work very seasonally, but very intensively with the family at night after they have their last meal of the day cooked by a boarding housekeeper, they have time. This is where you start to see the movement for petitions for shorter working days. This is where you see movements for walkouts for demanding worker rights. And I don't think that would be happening if they didn't have this space carved out together they're able to kind of form an awareness with each other of an identity as working women. Um, and that's when you start to see people pushing that mill girl label right back, right? Um, you know, are you more inclined to listen to a factory working woman's push for rights or a mill girl? Uh, if you think of yeah. them as factory workers, you kind of have to listen to them a little bit more. So that's where the mill girl kind of does double work. Uh, women were also joining cooperatives, um, very similar to what you might find in a city today, where they're trying to cut out middlemen to get better, cheaper produce to supply kitchens like ones of a boarding house. Um, Sarah Bagley, who's a very big labor rights activist who actually moves to New York after she works in Lowell, is one of the people who pushes for these co-ops to, to make clean, fresh, good, you know, vital foods easier to supply to these boarding housekeepers feeding the women. So what kind of foods would they have eaten? Yeah, so one of the things that they would eat for breakfast, which young visitors are always especially interested in, is apple pie. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they are actually eating some pretty sizable meals. And part of that is eating in the factories is really not just discouraged, it's outlawed. Um, so you're not seeing the kind of pan toting that you might see in later years. There's no luncheonettes yet, there's no diners, those are coming later. Um, they're eating three heavy meals into their work day. They start work, they have a very heavy breakfast um, with things like cod balls, apple pie, they might have squash. Um, for some women coming from vulnerable circumstances or particularly Irish laborers who come to the city in the 1840s, 
the availability and consistency of food would have really been a shock um, to some people or, or a new experience. Um, and these places also really depended on Irish labor, Irish women who came in and worked really as a supplement in the kitchen because boarding house keepers were making these massive family style meals three times a day. Um, but very, I always say it's very heavy carb. They wouldn't have understood it that way, but very heavy carb, lots of coffee, not a lot of water. Um, so we would understand them today as kind of carved up and dehydrated. Okay. You know, um, I don't know if we talked about this, but um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, uh, very often uh, her, her domestic help um, was, were young Irish immigrant women. Um, and, uh, she, I, I remember reading that she said that, um, you know, once they <laughs> learned the language and, um, gained some skills and, um, gained some knowledge of, of the new place that they were living, they moved on to, you know, bigger, <laughs> brighter, uh, futures. And, um, and, you know, she seemed pretty, um, you know, pretty supportive of that for them. So what was the difference in the life of a woman so like uh, after a young woman worked in the mill what were her prospects after that mm -hmm. so Thomas Dublin has done a lot of long and extensive work on this and part of what he finds is they they are still very likely to marry and to marry a man but they are more likely to marry a man who's worked in a trade outside of farming or who lives in a city they themselves are also more likely to live in a city. And there's a, a kind of, there's something that happens, right, to a person who has this type of experience. Once they become a wage earner as a woman, once they've opened a bank account as a woman, a lot of these people are really changed by that experience. Um, I think they're more likely to be active in certain kinds of causes, not necessarily suffrage, but we see really high rates of women in bold giving money to causes such as abolition. They're more likely to sign petitions, I would say, than people in a farming community, you know, one town over. Most people did this work temporarily and moved on. They took whatever money they made. Um, but you do see some of those, again, kind of longstanding changes of they are very much less likely to just go back to life on a farm. And that was really the fear. That was the fear that if women earned money that they could hold in their hands and deposit in a bank account, would women still want to do what they were increasingly understanding as unpaid labor for men and dependents? Um, and in some cases, the answer is no. Some people do stay in the boarding house system for a long time. Um, it really does change people in that way. And that was a very big social fear. Um, Oris Disbronson writes a very long article about, you know, whether factory work really kind of taints a woman forever. Wow. You know, whether these women yeah. <laughs> are, are still people that you should marry. And when you think of that experience of having that precious time to yourself in the evening, um, you know, for some women it was short-lived, but of course that might having access to libraries, having access to your own bank account, that's certainly going to change you. It's very, yeah, it certainly causes a, a certain amount of independence. But you know what you were just talking about, um, Allison, about, you know, are these women uh, still suitable for a marriage after they work in the mills? Uh, reminds me of one of the, um, you know, at the park in our exhibits, we have um, some anti-suffrage um, mm. memorabilia. And um, what you just said really reminded me of some of the um, postcards and posters for the anti-suffrage campaigns in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, and one in particular, uh, there's a gentleman standing by the stove holding a baby and stirring a pot and the, the caption reads, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, but the caption reads, what, what's next for him if she gets the vote or um, some such thing, but so, you know, here we are with, you know, in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s, and then also again in, you know, the, the, the first 20 years of, of the, the 20th century, you know, 50, 60, 70 years later, and um, it's still the same question. 
Like, are, are, are these women who work in industry still suitable to be domestic for men? Uh, questions of domesticity and, um, and working outside the home, um, really up even until my time when I was having, um, you know, raising my son, um, the question of working in the home and out of the home was still posed to, to, to women. So what do you say we make a pie? I would love to do that. And I think in the, the grand tradition of being a mill girl, I will watch while you cook. Oh, that's a good <laughs> And so are you familiar with, um, with Lydia Maria Child's uh, cookbook, The Frugal Housewife? Yes. Uh, oh. Lydia Maria Child was a favorite author of Women in Bowl. Oh, she was. Oh, yeah. Let's make a pie. Hi, welcome to my kitchen. So um, you heard us talking about pie and that the mill, the young mill girls and the young, young mill women would use, um, uh, eat pie for breakfast. So we thought we would make a pie today. Um, and we also talked about Lydia Maria Child and her recipe. So she had a book called The Frugal Housewife. Uh, so I wanted to read you her recipe. This is what her <laughs> says. When you make apple pies, stew your apples very little indeed. Just strike them through to make them tender. Some people do not stew them at all, but cut them up in, a very, th in very thin slices and lay them flat in the crust. Pies made in this way may retain more of the spirit of the apple, but I do not think the season mixes in as well. Put in sugar to your taste. It's impossible to make a precise rule because apples vary so much in acidity. A very little salt and a small piece of butter in each pie makes them richer. Cloves and cinnamon are both suitable spice. Lemon brandy and rose water are both excellent. A wine glass full of each is sufficient for three or four pies. If your apples lack spirit, grate the lemon. So okay. the recipe we're gonna go by, <laughs> You want to help me out here? I do. So Denise, you're an excellent cook. I am very much um, of a, a boarding house era style homemaker, wherein I do not use the kitchen very much. What you described to me feels more like a blog entry than a recipe. So I decided that I would practice this before, you know, our conversation uh, so that I could come up with the recipe that we posted. It took a few tries to get from <laughs> Lydia's story to this actual recipe. I like to say that I am a good cook and that I have been a good cook for a number of years. I had some very good teachers, <laughs> but baking was just always a struggle for me. And so I have been trying to, in the last couple of years, but really especially um, during this pandemic, it was somewhat easy to figure out what she was saying and somewhat difficult. Mm -hmm. um, because she is the frugal, her book is The Frugal Housewife, um, Lydia Maria Child believes that you could make a pie with a ratio of one to two butter to flour. Mm -hmm. So, because, you know, she needs to be a little uh, frugal with the, with the butter. Uh, and also, um, butter was a little more, um, available than lard, which would also have been used at the time. So what we have here is one pound of stone ground whole wheat flour. And so one pound comes out to be about um, a scant three cups and a very <laughs> fluffy three cups, so not packed, um, but a scant fluffy three mm. And then we're going to add to that a half a pound of salted butter. So we don't use salted butter much in, uh, right, right now. Um, we tend to um, really use uh, unsalted butter, especially in baking, because then you have control over the salt that you add. This is, I've learned this at the Mary Berry School of Baking. <laughs> you can attend that school too, you know. <laughs> I, I might, 
or I might just read Lydia Maria Child. I might go more to her fiction section than her yeah. piece. <laughs> uh, I I was reading about her and um, some of the her novels sound so interesting. I think I really do want to, uh, especially like the one she wrote, one about women, um, mm. um, Boston during uh, during the colonial era before the revolution, and how that might affect uh, their their life and that they could. You know, kind of have the power to participate in, um, in civic government. Very so like you're saying, these books, this is a very small domestic cookery book from a little bit earlier. They don't really have a lot of numbers. It's really, <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you're someone who's used to learning how to bake something from the back of a box, this is completely different. It's more like tools to understand how to bake and how to cook than exact directions. Yeah. Um, so all I'm doing here, and so this honestly is the truth. I learned this um, book <laughs> very, very, and uh, a lot of YouTube videos, kind of squeezing the butter into the flour. Uh, and I'm going to do that. So there's no big clumps left. Now the recipe that you listed had a lot more about the apples. And so someone like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, where would she get apples for her pie? I would think that Elizabeth, you know, someone of her uh, means and uh, the stature that she had in society, she probably had her own apple trees. She probably had a number of different fruit trees uh, in her yard over there on Washington Street. You know, one story that we know about you know, she, she lived right on the edge of the um, immigrant community here in Seneca Falls, uh, and she was actually pretty close with a lot of the um, uh, immigrant, Irish immigrant women. Uh, mm. she, and, um, you know, she would often be called, you know, for a domestic dispute, to be honest. Um, and, and oftentimes also she was called to their house to help them deliver their babies. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. um, but so one of the things that she did do, because she did live right on the outskirts uh, of, of the immigrant community, uh, she would let the, um, the young kids in the neighborhood come and pick fruit uh, off her <laughs> season. So this seems to be coming together. Then we just add um, the water, all the short crust. So it's just um, butter flour and water and salt, but the salt is in the flour. So water, we're going to use just about a cup of ice water. Uh, and it took me a few tries mm -hmm. to figure out how much water. Because she's frugal, she didn't write her cookbook for Elizabeth Cady Stanton. <laughs> no. Or the women who worked in Elizabeth Cady Stanton's house. Um, but also for a lot of women just around the country who really didn't even have the means, you know, she wanted to make sure that they had access to, to these ideas and uh, methods that, uh, that she was promoting. Okay, so I see our crust starting to form. What, what's oh. gonna happen next? So now, um, this is you know, another new trick that I've learned. So just know that I am not a pro. Uh, so you make a well in the middle. You see the well? So you make a well in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> And then you put the water in there. So I'm using a third of a cup at a time without an ice cube. Uh, so I'm going to put a third of a cup in the into the well at a time. And then I'm just going to put my fingers on the outside of the bowl and kind of go up underneath that well of water and just kind of fluff mm. it around so that the water kind of gets in and mixes in with the butter uh, and the flour there. So we're going to use a just about a cup of water. I think I just said that. Um, so we're going to use just about a cup of water. I'm going to do two full thirds and then a little less. That's a quarter, a quarter, a quarter and an eighth. Is it seven eighths? That's seven eighths, yeah. My sister, the math teacher, would be so proud. <laughs> right? Well, people like Stanton, you know, as part of their movement for women's education would argue that in some ways there's no better way to learn math than through cooking or to reinforce math skills through cooking. I yeah. didn't learn math that way, but maybe I'd be a better cook or mathematician. Very good idea. <laughs> um, she was a, um, a 
a really large outspoken advocate for uh, women's education. Um, and not just uh, academic education, she was um, very outspoken uh, and a, a, a very large proponent of uh, physical education for women. Mm. Um, as far as parenting goes, Elizabeth K. Stanton was very, very, very ahead of her time. Uh, she believed that even children um, had the right to reason and make mm. decisions, and she would, um, you know, let them do as such. Now, there's this one funny story about her son having a piano lesson, and the piano teacher comes to teach him piano, and he wanted to go outside, and so <laughs> she let him go outside, and you know, said, "Yeah, he has a mind of his own. He'll, you know, he'll make the right decision." And the piano teacher went, "He's not going to make the right decision. He's a boy. He's no, <laughs> right? Like, who wouldn't?" So, but way ahead of her time. So it seems to be just coming together. And again, I am no pro here. I am, <laughs> for those of you who are watching, I am learning with you. Believe me when I tell you. So I'm just going to put a little, a little bit of flour on there. Now just take this into a bowl. And if we need at this point, if and when we might need a little bit more water, um, I do it. I just mm -hmm. like my hands right into the bowl of water and uh, and do it that way. Uh, so that way you're not getting too much water. Um, <laughs> and you want to need this, but really just a little bit. You don't. Um, it doesn't really need to be needed too much. Um, and because. Um, you know, as Lydia says, you know, this is, this is on the frugal side, right? So she's using, you know, half the amount of butter as she is flour. So it is going to be a little bit on the drier side. Um, in one of my, uh, and also because this is um, whole wheat, stone ground wheat, which is what would have been available at that time. Um, did you know, Allison? We are both on canals, right? So you're on a canal, and I'm on a canal here in Seneca Falls. The Seneca, the Cayuga Seneca Canal is part of the Erie Canal system. Uh, and until the Erie Canal opened in 1825 um, in New England, uh, we had to uh, supplement the wheat flour mm -hmm. rye. Uh, and then once the Erie Canal opened in this area, uh, Western New York was like at that point considered like a bread basket uh, where all the flour was grown. Uh, oh, yeah. Let's get this cut in half and we'll start rolling it out. Nice. It does make a little bit more um, than you need for a crust, for a two, um, a two crust pie, but better to have too much than not enough. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I was so surprised when we were looking through cookbooks together how many pies people were making with meat. You know, all kinds of meat and oysters and like they would put anything in a pie. Yeah, so didn't, wasn't it in uh, Lydia Maria Child's book that she, um, was it, what kind of oysters were they? Pickled oysters? A pickled oyster pie? Too many kinds of oysters, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, you know, very probably more typical in New England than mm -hmm. out this way, right? Which you, everybody who is um, watching with us can probably tell I am a native New Englander just from my speak. That was something that Mill Girls talked about a lot, which was becoming sort of city-fied, which uh -huh. was losing your accent, especially women from very rural parts of New Hampshire and Vermont. They would go home and then they would talk differently and people in their communities, you know, would not always respond so well to that, you know, that they went and kind of changed the way that they spoke based on this new place where they're living. But 
you know, I think a lot of people can relate to that. You want to fit in or you want to adapt something. Um, and then it's hard to go back. Yeah. Wow. That is kind of interesting. I mean, do you think that I will end up having a central <laughs> Western New York accent if I stay here long enough? I think so. I you think do. so. That looks really good. Does it? So it does. The, the pan I'm using, the pie plate, I mean. Yeah. This pie plate belonged to my aunt. But um, in studying um, about the pies from the 19th century, I help from you. <laughs> couldn't figure out what kind of a pie plate they would use. So they would use a pie plate that was similar to this, but it would be you know, a little bit thicker, right? A little bit taller. Mm -hmm. um, but about this width, you think? This is the biggest pie plate I own. And I have you know, probably four or five. So uh, this is the biggest one I own. So what I'm gonna do now is I am going to just poke some pork holes in the bottom. And then I'm going to put this wash on. You know, now we would use extract, right? Um, so the first one that I did, I didn't add this. And, um, and you could definitely tell in the tasting. Uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure I added it. But I didn't have rose water. So honest. I put in here, um, this is lemon juice um lemon zest mm. so it is uh two tablespoons of lemon juice one uh teaspoon of lemon zest two tablespoons of melted butter <laughs> uh and an egg yolk nice and to um kind of add the rose water kind of additive to that um i kind of made my own water. So I took a half a cup of water. <laughs> I added three quarters of a teaspoon, oh no, a whole teaspoon of um, vanilla extract and a quarter of a teaspoon of almond extract. Nice. Uh, and the reason I added the almond is because, you know, almond extract has this like huge flavor, um, but vanilla is like really, you know, balanced and I do like the two together. Okay, so here is our bottom crust. So we're going to add the apples now. So I have just about nine, this is 10 Macintosh apples uh, that are peeled and cut and cored. In here I have a half a cup of sugar, a teaspoon and a half mm. of cinnamon, and an eighth of a teaspoon of clove, ground clove. So I'm going to mix, yeah, so I'm going to mix that in uh, with the apples and then put that on the top. So our oven is on 400 uh, and we are going to cook this in a 400 degree oven for 40 to 45 minutes. Um, so I'm going to say like just you know keep an eye on your stove. You you definitely have to make this Allison. I do, I do. My next, my next trip home we're gonna have, we're gonna have pie. <laughs> we are gonna so, have pie, Allison. So where did you get those apples and kind of what made you choose Macintosh for this project? Uh, I found out that so very many of the apples that we eat today weren't even around in the middle of 19th century. Mm -hmm. um, and, but Macintosh were, and they grew here. So there is kind of a, uh, and they also grew in New England. Hmm. Uh, so, um, so my thought was, what kind of apples might Elizabeth Cady Stanton have had in her orchard? Uh, and I came across a couple that I thought would be uh, Rome apples, um, mm. and, um, uh, and Macintosh apples. So this, that's a lot of apples, right? So that's like nine. Yeah. This is going to be a tall pie. It is going to be a tall pie. So. Now something you said to me before was so interesting was about sugar and 
where you would get your sugar from in Stanton's time was something so political for people, largely because of its connection to the slave trade. So can you tell us how people in Seneca Falls were making choices about that in you know 1840s or 1850s? We have two people in our story here at Women's Rights, Mary Ann and Thomas McClintock. They ran a store over in um, Waterloo. Uh, and before they came to uh, this area, they were in Philadelphia. And in Philadelphia, they started Philadelphia Free Produce Society. And what that meant was that they did not um, sell or support any product that was created with slave labor. And they continued that tradition oh. came here. There were a couple of alternatives, honey, um, was an alternative, um, but also um, maple sugar um, was a was a real alternative um, both in central western New York and and in New England. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, it's believed that um, that the uh, French women, uh, you know, just north of me here, uh, were taught uh, how to. Um, make maple syrup and maple sugar uh, from the Haudenosaunee women who lived in this area uh, before uh, white settlers. My little mat here that I <laughs> was rolling around. Um, I bet Lydia Maria Child and uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's domestic <laughs> have a fix for that. In some ways, you know, because you're really wanting to learn, right, not just to make one thing, like these recipes are better for you because it's teaching you ways to think about it versus, you know, just how to get it done. Like such a total shift. Yeah, you know, this is this this is gonna sound really funny. My mother is a, an amazing baker, right? And growing up, I she would bake all the time, and I would watch her. And then as I became, you know, a young woman and and was a young mother, and I would try to bake, and it would be <laughs> terrible. But my mom, you know, really did, did. She really did employ some of those beliefs. Mm. But it's a two to one. It's, you know, it's about the ratios. And, you know, she understands that much. <laughs> um, but I am coming in my, in my learning process. Um, I am coming to, uh, to those understandings that that is um, really... A big part of it. It's not really just about following the directions of a recipe, like in cooking, which I don't do that either very well. I, you know, how, yeah. how much, you know, how much parsley do you put in your sauce? Well, it's this much, you know. Um, <laughs> that's, that's kind of how I do it. So I'm going to use my trusty scissors, my kitchen shears, as they're called, to uh, cut around this. So this is just a little bit of the extra. That pie is huge. Isn't it? I think it is. I think it would be good to like fuel your day in the factory, which is where I am now. Oh, and you know, you, you had mentioned that before that, you know, it was a very heavy kind of, you know, diet, right? Okay, so yeah. I'm gonna do my ugly crimping. <laughs> I mean, we would use really different words than they would, you know, in the 1840s, but to use kind of our nutrition language today, very carb heavy, carbohydrates, very much heavy in starch and really giving women heavy, dense caloric meals before they go to work. And then, you know, not snacking in between, not kind of these little bites and eating um, a pretty serious meal in the middle of the day to really kind of keep you going for 14 hours. In the summer, we can put in some long hours in the park service and, and it's a lot of fun, right? It's a whole different world than what those women were going through. Elizabeth Katie Stanton and, you know, and the women's movement, I mean, she's working in the home, out of the home. You know, she's kind of doing all of that. She must've been exhausted. And food just was not, you know, necessarily readily available to people the way that it is today. Like, you know, taking money even out of the equation, the way that you can walk through a downtown and buy lunch, you know, the boarding house keepers in early Lowell were forbidden from having people just come in and get meals. And some of them did it anyway. Um, but for the most part, you or someone you had a close relationship with was responsible for really feeding you outside of taverns. 
And 200 years later, our world is so completely different. So, so we talked earlier about, you know, the people who cooked for all of these uh, women and um, what was their life like? Hard. <laughs> Hard, yeah. Because um, they could be up and have breakfast ready, you know, for all of those women, right? All of yeah. those girls which we know were a, a lot, right? You said how many hundred, a couple hundred, right? So the complex where we recorded our first portion, um, the unit that I was in would have between 25 and 40 women, depending. And then if you were a widower who had children and ran a boarding house, you'd have your own family to feed. Um, but you could easily be feeding 40, 50 people three meals a day and, you know, of course, they don't have a lot of the shortcuts that we have today. And in the 1840s and 1850s, a lot of the manufacturers who were making stoves really kept telling women that they were more efficient, they were faster, they were easier. And women across the board said, no, they're not. <laughs> and, uh, you know, historians of technology have studied these changes and shown that they were more labor intensive in some ways. And, the learning curve was so stark because a lot of what you might have learned as a young person no longer translated with these new stoves. So it's a lot to really kind of take in all at once and it's very hard work. Well, it kind of makes sense now that Elizabeth Cady Stanton said when she said, you know, she didn't really blame uh, these young women for wanting to do more than, you know, circle around the stove all day. Okay, I think we're just about done here. I like it. I'm going to cut a little more off over here. Okay, so let me know what you think. I think it looks great. It is gigantic, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It's a huge pie. <laughs> oh my god. And you know I'm not going to get away with not making one of these for Thanksgiving now. No, no, absolutely not. It's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, we got to put a little bit of a little bit of this wash. My vanilla almond butter egg wash. I love it. And lemon on our little pretty apples. Because I think that Lydia would have. That she's frugal, right? So she would have used everything that she could use. And so if there's extra, she's going to find something to do with that, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, so my mom used to take all that and roll it out and put cinnamon and sugar in it and roll it up. And so I did that with the very first one um, that I made and I, it was, it was dry, Let, let's, <laughs> um, but I thought, wow, if I was going to put anything in this, because this is a really rich, nutty uh, wheat, right? It has a lot of flavor, um, mm. but wow, if I was going to put anything in this, um, in the crust itself, I would probably put cinnamon in it. I think that would be like just a great yes. idea. I don't know if anyone's ever put, you know, cinnamon in pie crust, but all right, well, let's get this in the oven and then we'll pause for I love it. or so and we'll come back and, uh, see what it looks like. Well, 40 minutes. Awesome. Let's get this in. Oh, it looks like our pie is done. Let's see. <gasps> Careful, it's hot. It is hot. Oh, hot and steamy. <laughs> oh, look at this, Allison. That looks great. Yeah, isn't it? Woo! So let's, let's, awesome. let's take this and cut it. What do you think? Let's put it down. I like it. It's down. We can take it, uh, we can take it into the dining room and cut it. And uh, Perfect. Um, conversation with our, with our virtual visitors here and we can do some question and answer. What do you think? I can't wait to hear everybody's questions. Oh, I'm so excited. 
I hope they don't ask me like really, you know, like baking questions. But we're happy to talk about <laughs> Women's Rights National Historical Park and, and your story at Lowell National Historical Park and uh, share the connections that they had with food uh, and how they uh, used food to, to, you know, move through life. Absolutely. You can't wait to hear them. I'm pretty excited. Let's go cut this pie open. <laughs>